Just studies at Stanford University and a JD from UCLA School of Law. The idea for Breitbart News Network was born when the late Andrew Breitbart and Mr. Solov, childhood friends and both Jewish, took a trip to Israel in 2007. Mr. Solov left his law practice to help launch the company from Mr. Breitbart's basement. Today, Breitbart News is one of America's top news sites, and it has one of the most engaged Facebook pages worldwide. Breitbart produces 38 hours of original radio programming per week on Sirius XM's Patriot Channel. Its morning show, Breitbart News Daily, has one of the highest call volumes of all Sirius XM programs. The news organization has bureaus in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., London, Jerusalem, and Rome. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Larry Solov to the podium. Hey everyone, thanks for having me at Hillsdale. Um, thanks Penny for the introduction, you took half my speech. Um, so this will be short. Um, so I hope a lot of you have heard of my company, Breitbart News Network, uh, even if you've never heard of me before, but I'm gonna take a minute to tell you a little bit about uh, both. So I am President, CEO, and General Counsel of Breitbart News Network. Breitbart News, as Penny just told you, was the brainchild of the late, great Andrew Breitbart, who tragically died at the age of 43, suddenly of a heart attack on March 1st, 2012. Andrew, for those of you that might not be familiar, um, was a true genius and a real news and media savant. Um, he worked in the beginning out of college uh, for the Drudge Report. I hope you all know the Drudge Report. Um, for a long time, the Drudge Report was Matt Drudge, and then what was not known was that eight to 10 hours of the day, it was Andrew Breitbart. Um, that started in the 90s. That was the Monica Lewinsky scandal with Bill Clinton. That was, you know, a really amazing time where the internet was just kind of, you know, coming into full swing, and there were a lot of opportunities for new news personalities, new news organizations. So Andrew first helps Matt Drudge build the Drudge Report into just a juggernaut. Um, later, he worked for a woman named Ariana Huffington. Ooh. Ariana, okay, I'm gonna shock it, most people. I'm gonna shock the lower level. <laughs> Shout out to the higher level, but like, I'm not gonna shock anyone up there. Um, she was once a conservative. Yeah, so when Andrew worked for her, she was a conservative, a well-known conservative pundit. Um, and they worked together on a number of things. She ran for governor in California got a massive like 0.4% of the vote, lost to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Andrew told her, said, don't run. He has, but you've got best-selling books, you know, you're, you know, once a year, you're successful. If you run, everyone will know you don't have a constituency. She ran, she lost, and she turned to Andrew and she said, oh, Andrew, what am I going to do now? And Andrew came up with the idea for the Huffington Post. You all know the Huffington Post? Heard of it? Okay. Um, that was Andrew's um, kind of brain, you know, first brainchild. And in fact, Andrew's widow, Susie, named the Huffington Post. Ariana wanted to call it the Huffington Report. And Susie said, that's dumb, just call it the Huffington Post. Andrew went in the next day and said, what about the Huffington Post? And she's like, great, let's do that. Um, so, where do you know I come in to the story? Andrew Breitbart and I grew up in Brentwood, California. We were both adopted, and we grew up right next to each other. We knew our, we knew each other. I'm nine months older than Andrew was. We knew each other our whole lives. 
you know, like when you barge into someone's house when you get home from school and spend five hours, and our dads coached all of our little league teams together, and um, we were, we were, you know, very inseparable. Cutting to later in life, as you heard, I went to Stanford, I studied religion. Later I went to UCLA Law School, became a lawyer, a business litigator at one of these, you know, 1,000, 1,200 attorney, you know, law firms, and I kind of settled into uh, my life. Andrew was still my best friend. I was the best man at his wedding, and um, I was uh, merrily going on as a lawyer. So Andrew, in the meantime, is doing drudge, the Huffington Post, launching the Huffington Post. Um, and then Andrew got a boondoggle. You guys don't know that phrase. Andrew got invited to an all-expense paid trip to Israel because he was working, I mean, he was working in, with important people. And so he said, I want to go to Israel. Andrew and I are both Jewish. We we're both bar mitzvah at the same synagogue. And he said, you've always wanted to go to Israel, Larry, right? And I said, yeah. So he, he said, go as my lawyer. So I went as his lawyer. That summer of 2007, Andrew Breitbart and I, best friends our whole lives, never talked about working together in a hotel in Tel Aviv. He still insists it was Jerusalem. Andrew just turns to me one day and says, why don't you be partner from the law firm? Let's become business partners and let's change the world. Oh, and let's do it from my basement in your home office. Um, I mean, that's compelling, right? Um, but in all fairness, the guy had started, basically helped you know, start the Drudge Report and the Huffington Post, so it wasn't like you know, he didn't have some kind of track record. Um, our initial primary concern, which is still a major concern, is that the mainstream media bias out there meant that a lot of new, newsworthy news stories were not being told. And those that were being told were very often being told under a false guise of objectivity. Um, you know, I think a lot of you, I'm speaking to the lower uh, level, um, might, you know, not remember there was a time where, uh, I'm 52, and I remember growing up, and in the night you had three nightly news programs. You had CBS, NBC, ABC. They each had a half an hour, an hour to tell you what the news was. And you were told that these anchors were objective and told you the truth. So that was kind of commonly understood. I think people understand differently now. But Andrew believed that there was no such thing as objective news reporting. And what he meant by that, and what I mean by that is, point of view was inevitable. As hard as you tried to keep out point of view, you couldn't. And point of view comes in, or, by the way, point of view is a nice way of saying bias. Um, but it came in in a number of ways, most specifically story selection. If I'm the New York Times, I have one printed page a day, homepage. If I'm Breitbart.com and I only have you know, so much that you'll scroll down. Uh, if I'm a nightly news program and I only have a half an hour to tell you the news, whoever's making the decision um, to, as to which stories to emphasize versus the millions of stories that happen in the world every day is making a very important decision informed by their view of what's important for you to know. So story selection is the first way. The second way is, look, no matter, we're human. No matter how hard a lot of people try, your slant eventually kind of works into your reporting or your story. For some people, a lot. For some people, a little, you know, a little bit. Um, but it's there. But to Andrew, the solution was you still had to report the truth. You still had to report accurately. But to disclose your point of view to your reader. Let the consumer be informed of your point of view. And then let the consumer make the decision as to your reader make the decision as to whether they liked what you were reporting, if your point of view was affecting it too little, too much. And basically, it was a respect for um, the American news you know, consumer. So the other thing to do was to create a number of new media companies that could start to report the stories that were being ignored by the mainstream media. So we hired our first employee in 2008 while he was still at Berkeley, head of the Republicans, 
at Berkeley, and he's now our editor-in-chief. We published our first original content in 2009. Some of our better-known early stories were the Acorn story. I won't go into it in great detail. Some of you might remember it. The Anthony Weiner story. Um, I don't know how many of you remember that story. And, um, you know, at that point, um, you know, we were really much, pretty much off to the races. I do want to mention uh, that um, Andrew, before he passed away, wrote a book called Righteous Indignation, Excuse Me While I Save the World. And it was, Andrew never thought small. Um, or if you prefer, there was a DVD called Hating Breitbart. I'd recommend that anyone get those. They're important, um, I think, in, and, and not only that, very fun to read. I don't make any money on it. I'm just, uh, I'm just sharing with you what I think would be um, a fun thing to do. So let me jump ahead. 2016, we had quite a year. Okay, so don't take my word for it. Um, in 2016, Brexit happened in England. Nigel Farage, who was the leader of the Brexit movement in 2018 said, Brexit would not have happened without Breitbart. We have a London bureau, as Penny said, and we did a lot of the coverage out of there. Clinton's campaign press secretary, Brian Fallon said, excuse me, because I'm gonna read, one of the realities is that I don't, that I don't think was truly appreciated by our campaign was just how profound the Breitbart effect was in cultivating a standalone ecosystem in conservative media that very aggressively and successfully promoted certain stories and narratives we had a blind spot for during the campaign. And President Obama said, Breitbart did something pretty interesting. Now they didn't create a whole new platform, but they did shift the entire nar media narrative in a different direction in a powerful direction. So a lot of you might have first heard of us in around that time. Right now, um, you know, despite the fact uh, that the left has tried to destroy Breitbart in every way, shape, and form, Breitbart is, according to uh, Amazon-owned Alexa, ranking the 47th largest website in the United States. That's not just news websites, that's all websites. Um, in terms of news, we're behind New York Times, CNN, and Fox. We had 30 million unique visitors to our website alone in the last 30 days. We have the radio show on Sirius XM, the daily radio show uh, on Sirius XM Patriot Channel, and we currently have the sixth most engaged Facebook publisher page in the world. Through social media, we probably reach two to three times as many people as we reach directly on the website. Um, You've heard about our bureaus. On election night, Breitbart finished second in share of voice on Facebook. Um, that was better than the New York Times, NBC, CBS News, USA Today, and the New York Post combined. We were second only to Fox News. Okay, so that's who we are, that's who I am, enough of that, let's switch gears. <laughs> Um, when I was asked to come here, I jumped at the chance. The first interaction, quick aside, the first interaction I had with Hillsdale, I just told this story to somebody. Um, Andrew and I had been working together for two years. It was 2010. I hadn't had a vacation in two years. Uh, it was a very tough, you guys, a startup company is very tough, very rewarding, but don't expect to make money and expect to work 24 hours a day. Um, and my parents said they were going on a cruise to the Mediterranean, said, hey, why don't you come along, you know? And I said, sure, I was just, you know, desperate. And, and I went into Andrew and I said, you know, we've been doing this for two years, I haven't taken a vacation, I'm gonna take a vacation with my family, we're gonna go to the Mediterranean uh, on a cruise. And Andrew said, when? And I said, you know, July, such and such. And he goes, where does it go? And I said, it starts in, I forget where it started, maybe like, Venice, and it ends in London. He said, what ship? And I said, the Crystal, the, the you know, Crystal Symphony or something. And he goes, I'm on that cruise. Hillsdale invited me <laughs> to, sp to speak on that cruise. I go, what are the chances? I mean, look, we're, we desperately need, as I mean, we're best friends and we love each other, but we desperately need some time apart. And Andrew and I end up in the same cruise because he was invited by Hillsdale 
you know, to be on the cruise. So that's my first touch point with Hillsdale, by the way. Uh, I cruised with some, some or, you know, of you probably in 2010, even if you don't remember. I remember it was a, a great thing. But seriously, uh, I had the utmost, and when I, I jumped at the chance to speak here, I don't speak often, I really don't. I, I have the utmost appreciation for Hillsdale College students, faculty, friends, and family. What you guys are doing is so amazing and necessary, and, and in a lot of ways, like Breitbart, Hillsdale just punches way above its, its weight class, and that's a testament to, uh, I'm sure, a lot of people, but uh, everyone should you know, feel good. Um, but I also am here because I believe that big tech raises some of the most complicated legal, ethical, political, policy, economic, uh, issues that we face today. And I will contend today, big, big tech poses an existential threat to free speech, freedom of the press, rights of consciousness, or rights of conscience, and the free and open exchange of ideas upon which our republic depends, the health of our American democracy depends. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of the issues raised by big tech. Tonight I've been specifically asked to make the case for regulation. Apparently you heard earlier today the case against regulation. I'm going to change the title of the speech, uh, respectfully asking for the case for regulation frames the issue far too narrowly. Because big tech presents so many issues at this point. You have competition related issues public safety concerns, privacy concerns, consumer data protection issues, cultural and psychological issues. There's a great Netflix uh, documentary called The Social Dilemma that if you guys haven't seen it, you might want to see. It talks a lot, about, a lot about that. And then censorship and content moderation. So not surprisingly, given this you know, panoply of issues, um, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. Sure. Regulation can be uh, uh, helpful and a solution to some of these issues, certainly not all of them, but there is also antitrust, legislation, civil litigation, political pressure, civil and criminal penalties. And I think the main point is we are, we are far enough into this big tech um, experiment to know one thing for sure, big tech cannot be trusted to govern itself. That is crystal clear at this point. So if I may, I'm not going to make a case specifically for regulation. I'm going to make a case for action. Because the price of inaction at this point is the erosion of our freedoms. And when I speak to this audience in particular, when you take big tech's monopoly power and you combine it with their political agenda and their censorship, it is an existential threat to the conservative movement and to our republic by extension. So with that, let me turn first to Google. Um, Google has become in many ways the gatekeeper of the internet. A lot of people would say the monopoly gatekeeper of the internet. So it is estimated that 90% of all searches in the United States are conducted through Google search. When it comes to mobile, the number's higher. It's actually 95%. And the DOJ, that's the Department of Justice, um, estimates that over 60% of those searches are achieved through exclusionary practices. Google crams down. So the main way that they do it is, is to force uh, mobile phone manufacturers, uh, telecommunication companies, to make Google the default search on devices, on computers, basically at any search access point. Um, those exclusionary you know, practices harm competition and thwart innovation. And it is that, for that reason that last month, you may have heard about this, the DOJ in conjunction with 11 states uh, brought an antitrust action against Google. Um, the specific thing they're going after is uh, a monopoly on search 
and search advertising. I personally applaud that decision. I think it's long overdue. I'd be lying if I told you that if there is a Biden administration, um, I have high hopes for the continuation or prosecution of that action. Um, I read today that, the, that Biden, if he ends up president, um, will be, or is looking to hire Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, into the administration in some capacity. So uh, color me surprised if some of this enthusiasm for going after Google uh, kind of disappears. And in fact, in 2012, Obama, the Obama administration abandoned an earlier effort to do this. But there's another you know, factor here that, and I, I hate to um, be the one to break this to you, I'm being a little facetious, Washington is very much bought and paid for by big tech at this point. They are flooding Washington with money. And frankly, a lot of these politicos in, in Washington, what's their best chance, what's their ideal job after they leave Washington? It's with the big tech companies. And that's how it works. So, you know, you know how are you going to make progress when there's so much money going around and all these people are looking to their next job? Uh, we should, as an aside, we should pressure our politicians not to accept money at this point from big tech. I think it's really important that we do that. There's another thing I want to talk about about Google, and this is, this risks getting into the weeds, but I think it is so important that I'm going to mention it anyway. I believe Google is, an ad, is a monopoly on advertising technology. Um, in fact, I was asked to speak to the DOJ in 2019 about this very subject. So, again, at the risk of getting into the weeds, online digital advertising is not bought and sold like TV advertising or magazine advertising, where a company puts a specific ad in a specific show or a specific magazine, hoping to reach everyone who's watching that show or reading that magazine. Digital ads are bought and sold almost entirely programmatically. That might not be a you know, term you're familiar with, but, it would, but it, what it really means is digital ads are bought and sold in an online auction through a bidding process. And that bidding process, there's, it's so good that bidding process is real time. So it happens very, very fast. And because of improvements in technology, data collection, data information, um, programmatic buys are no longer publisher or website specific. So you guys are all familiar with this. I'll just use an example to illustrate the point, one that I might be familiar with. Um, let's say you're looking for a new pair of tennis shoes, right? Um, you will notice that whether you go to Foot Locker or Dicks or Adidas or Nike, you're probably going to get hit with ads and you don't buy, you're probably going to get hit with the ads from those companies again and or from other shoe companies, right? Because they think they can get your business. So what's really happening is they're targeting you and they don't care if you are reading ESPN or Breitbart or fill in any of your 20 favorite sites. I included Breitbart in, as one of your favorite sites, so if you see what I did there. Um, and that's really, you know, these, this concept of ads following around individuals. I want you, because I saw you search, uh, you know, the best weekend places close to Hillsdale to take my girlfriend, and now you're gonna get every hotel in the area, you know, you know giving you ads. Um, so these ads are bought and sold on an exchange. And, and this is very much like, the easiest way to think about it is it's like a commodities or equities exchange, okay? But unlike with a commodities exchange, this exchange, this buying and selling of ads, entirely unregulated. Everything the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, would say you can't do if this were a commodities exchange gets done every second of every day on this programmatic ad exchange. Um, interestingly, Google controls the entire process. 
They control the entire pipeline. They control the buy side, the sell side. They control the exchange, and they take money out at every point in the way. They actually own a lot of the other ad networks bidding, and then they themselves buy off their own exchange. Every publisher I know, and you heard Floyd Brown speak earlier, every publisher I know has to use Google's ad-serving product. That's where you load ads onto your website. That's who you run all your ads through. It's called Double Click for Publishers. And the reason we have to is because we have no effective choice. It is too difficult and expensive to change, and there are anti-competitive practices built in. So um, there's one other thing that I think I can tell you that I hope, uh, and I promise to leave the weeds soon, um, will illustrate the problem uh, and how Google became a monopoly, frankly. Historically, this auction I'm talking about was a two-step auction. And in the second step of the auction, Google got to see what everyone else had bid, and then they could put in a bid and buy it a penny greater and resell it for a higher amount. I mean, if you think about that, it's, it's pretty incredible. It's like they're running the exchange, they know what everyone's bidding, they have an unfair competitive advantage, and then they're buying off the same exchange and, and competing. So two advertisers might say, hmm, I think I might have to bid a dollar to get ads on this. And another advertiser might say, I think I'm going to have to bid a uh, dollar ten. Well, Google knows exactly what they're going to bid and can bid one cent more. It's a massive, massive advantage. And that's part of the way they built up you know, their monopoly in ad tech. It's a, a system rigged with conflicts of interest uh, and with... Um, uh, you know, a lot of concerns. Now, when Google started to sense that the DOJ and others were looking into this practice, they, they said, okay, we're going to stop this second stage bid, right? But, so what? The monopoly's created. I mean, that's the point of a monopoly. Once you got it, you know, I mean, they don't care about giving it up now because they control everything. Um, I'll also submit to you that this will not change the fact that Google still controls, and Google is the only one who knows who wins a bid. And ultimately, they really decide which publishers get the ads and which publishers don't. So why, why is he talking about this? Why should you care? If you're an advertiser, you should care because you're probably paying more than you should. If you're a publisher, you should care because you're probably getting less than you should. And everyone should care and this goes to the broader subject of tonight. Because no one ad tech company should have that much control over picking winners and losers in the publishing space. Um, especially one that has shown a political agenda um, that we'll talk about a little bit more. In this regard, the state attorney generals who also have antitrust uh, options are, in fact, looking into this and considering their own antitrust actions against Google on these grounds. Um, but those would be different than the antitrust action that was filed last month that we started the discussion with. Let me turn to censorship, because I think what I am uniquely able to share with you is the perspective on big tech from the lived experience of a conservative news publisher. And let me talk more specifically how big tech is controlling the discussion and interfering with elections. But to do that, I'm gonna take a quick step back. Set the table, if you will. For a long time, and this is certainly true when I got into the business, the left has controlled uh, academics, uh, and this is why Hillsdale is so important, the media, and Hollywood, Hollywood being loosely the term for all the arts and entertainment. Um, and what they've done with that is tilt the playing field against conservatives by controlling them. But something started to change in the early 90s. The left forgot about AM radio. 
AM radio was dead. Everyone said AM radio is dead. And some conservatives went to AM radio and started doing talk radio. And I was kind of under the radar because the left didn't care. They thought FM was everything and AM was dead. I'm talking about Rush Limbaugh, you know, Dennis Prager, Hugh Hewitt, Larry Elder, all these people. Then the internet came. And with the internet, we were able to democratize news and information, both the gathering, the presentation, and the distribution of it. The internet lowered the bar of entry to the news business. And I'm living proof of that because two guys in a basement in Los Angeles in 2008 could start Breitbart. And that's possible because we didn't need the infrastructure of trucks to distribute papers and printing presses and all these other things that the legacy uh, media had. And then, still later, social media really turbocharged our ability to share information and break out past the Praetorian Guard of the mainstream media. So, 2016, the election of President Trump. The left was caught completely and utterly off guard. And that is a definition of an understatement, okay? Um, their response it was to usher in a new era of censorship and boycotts. Now, I'm gonna speak very broad brush here for a second, but the left basically redefined hate speech from the real definition of hate speech to anything that makes the left feel slightly uncomfortable and or with which they politically disagree, okay? And then they said hate speech must be banned. It must either be censored or anyone publishing health speech, hate speech should not be allowed to have advertising. Big tech facilitated and led this charge. Don't take my word for it. Let me go back to Google. Breitbart exclusively got our hands on an internal video of a meeting at Google the Friday after President Trump was elected. It contains the entire, if you haven't seen it, I promise, please look it up. It contains the entire leadership of Google expressing shock and dismay at Trump's victory and promising to correct the course. Let me give you one example, but please watch the whole hour video if you have some extra time. Vice President of Global Affairs and Chief Legal Officer Kent Walker said, Google is a trusted source of information for people around the world. That's incredibly value at times like this. History teaches us that there are periods of populism, of nationalism that rise up, and that's all the reason we need to be in the arena. That's why we have to work so hard to ensure that it doesn't turn into a world war or something catastrophic, but instead is a blip, is a hiccup. Basically, they wanted to make sure the election of Trump was a hiccup in history. And this video, when we got it out, really, really opened a lot of eyes. And because it's representative not just of the thinking at Google, which you all know owns YouTube, Facebook, which you all know owns Instagram, Twitter, and the other big tech giants. And the clarion call they heard from the left was, don't let 2016 happen again. So let me tell you what followed. I'm going to talk about Breitbart because I have experience with it. When I'm talking about Breitbart in this context, please understand this is happening to more than Breitbart. But I can just give you uh, examples directly from Breitbart more easily. We're still on Google. Since the 2016 election, Google has practically purged Breitbart News from its search results. In the run-up to the 2016 election, Google search was referring almost 8 million people a month to Breitbart through Google search. Breitbart's impact has only increased since 2016, but in the run-up to the 2020 election, that number dropped to 1.5 million. It's a 450% decrease. 
search visibility, which is a key industry measure of how findable a publisher's content is in Google, data, new data shows that Google suppressed Breitbart's search engine visibility by 99.7% after the 2016 election. And starting in May 6th of this year, 2020, searches on Google for Joe Biden or Joe Biden related search terms that went to Breitbart dropped to zero. Zero. Might have been May 5th, but you get my point. It's now so crazy that you can type in the exact headline of a Breitbart story and you will most likely not get it in Google. Unless there is a third party site that has plagiarized Breitbart and violated our copyright and put up our article on their website and they'll come up one or two in Google and we won't be in the top 100. Um, they will actually, these, these sites that rip off other sites will actually rank higher in Breitbart for Breitbart content than Breitbart. That, I submit to you, is election interference. And it emasculates our First Amendment, our protections for freedom of the press. And if you ask Google about it, they say nothing. They're not responsive, they won't answer the questions, nothing. Let's turn to Facebook for a second and let's look at what happened to, oh by the way, type those same Breitbart article headlines into DuckDuckGo or Bing, Breitbart's the number one search result. Um, unfortunately, as we talked about earlier, Google is the monopoly in the middle of the room and controls 90% of all searches in the United States. So it's great that Bing and DuckDuckGo don't screw everyone, but you know, that's just a, a minor you know, part at this point. Um, let's talk about what happened at Facebook after the 2016 election. Remember, Facebook and social media and Google get blamed for Trump's election. After the election in 2016, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook decided that they were only going to continue to promote news if it promotes the common, by the way, you can look this up on Facebook, it's still up, if it promotes the common good. I don't know what that means when you're talking about news. By the way, if you report that an engine on a plane, God forbid, blows up, how is that promoting or not promoting the common good? I mean, this is an absurd concept to me. Um, and they also said they are only going to, or they're going to prioritize trusted news sources. Well, that should scare everyone. Um, we said, what is a trusted news source? And they said, well, we've surveyed our people and so we know it's trusted. And we said, well, you know, how many people did you ask? We're not gonna tell you. Um, did you do anything to make sure that these people were, uh, you know, um, uh, some like a broad spectrum of ideologies? They don't tell you. Because it figures that controversial sites, and by the way, Breitbart is a controversial brand. In fact, two years ago, it was one of the top 50, Top 25 most controversial brands in America. A little bit ahead of Cabela's, I think. But, um, but you know who was more controversial than Breitbart? New York Times, CNN. So um, with controversial brands, you know what happens? Because people have an agenda to answer questions about trust, you know, a certain way. And you know, this should be an unsatisfactory answer, but it tells you what they were doing. They were gonna start making the calls as to what you, it's not about what you wanna see. It doesn't matter which sites you've liked or not on Facebook. They are gonna show you what they think you should see, not what you wanna see, because it's for your own good. Um, and it became a very opaque process. So let me give you another example of what's happening with Facebook. It's the fact-checking program. Um, 
And I'm going to give you um, a couple examples. So there's this hysteria created about, the, about fake news. We've got to root out fake news. We've got to root out fake news, which is the justification for starting fact-checking programs. I'm still on Facebook. So Facebook decides they're going to have a fact-checking program. And what they decide is that they're going to farm out fact-checking of publishers to third-party fact-checkers. Problem number one, to be a third-party fact-checker for Facebook, you have to have been approved by the Pointner Institute. So if, if you're not familiar with the Pointner Institute, it's funded by George Soros' Open Society Foundations and the Omidyar Network. So the fact-checking skews left to begin with. There are other additional reasons why. Limited time tonight, I'm not going to go into them. But the fact-checking is primarily done from a liberal perspective. Let me give you an example when this first came uh, on our radar in a very serious way. It was April of 2019. We got fact-checked on an opinion piece by a writer, John Nolte. John was commenting on a study that had just come out that said carbon dioxide in the environment was greater three million years ago than now. And John wrote an opinion piece, marked his opinion, and used that fact to suggest, well, doesn't that kind of suggest that all, you know, your climate change is not man-made? There weren't, you know, we weren't running cars three million years ago. So that got fact-checked as, as, as false by a group called Science Feedback. Um, the study was not in dispute. That's what the study said. They just disagreed politically with the possible conclusions that could be drawn from that study. So they rated it false. Incredibly, Facebook has no appeals process to Facebook. And they do not, they will admit this, they conduct zero oversight over their fact checkers. They don't rate them, they don't monitor to see if they're doing it well, not well, or anything like that. They do say they're coming out with some kind of broad appeals board. Uh, it is unclear if that will apply to fact checks. It's unclear a lot of things, but I feel it's my duty to, to mention that. So what does Facebook tell us? We say this is, um, I'm going to use... Uh, a scientific term, both a legal term and a news business term, you know, we said this fucking bullshit, okay? And they said, well, you have to appeal, you can't appeal to us, you have to appeal to science feedback. Before I tell you the result of our appeal to science feedback, I want to give you a data point. As I was writing our appeal, I thought to myself, hey, why don't I research the guy that wrote the fact check for science feedback? guy named Scott Johnson. I go back and I find an article where he calls Breitbart a bunch of idiot white nationalists. That's the guy that's fact-checking whether, that's the guy that's fact-checking this article. How do you think our appeal turned out? Not surprisingly, strike one. Okay. Here's the way it works. Three false strikes with Facebook and a publisher drops in the algorithm and can be prevented from monetizing all its content. Um, Breitbart gets strike one. So now Breitbart has a decision to make. Risk a second strike or stop putting up anything on Facebook that even remotely opines that climate change is anything other than 100% man-made. That has a, this is not obvious to most people if you're not familiar with how this is working. This has a tremendous chilling effect on reporting. Because no publisher wants to be taken off Facebook. We're seeing it again right now in the context of allegations of voter fraud in this election. On Twitter, you guys have probably seen it, on Twitter, Facebook, wherever, if you comment on election fraud, by the way, you don't even have to allege there's election fraud. You can say the president says there's election fraud or um, you know, whatever. You now get a little notice with your post that says, this is disputed, 
you know, lots of this, some bipartisan group that I've never heard of has determined that there's no real election fraud. I mean, this is 1984 Orwellian shit. Okay, you're not even allowed to have a discussion and they try to clamp down on it. Um, what they've also started to do, I'm talking about Facebook in particular, is they have started to apply fact checks using AI. And what that's doing is leading to tons of bad fact checks. We've been the subject of, I have my VP of communications here, Elizabeth. We, I mean, this becomes a full-time job if you're a publisher. You know, you report something really simple. There were 6,000 votes that result, you know, resulted from a glitch that were switched from Biden to Trump. It's a very factual statement, you get fact checked. Well, and the fact check says, well, the glitch was not the software, it was human error. We didn't say what it was. Now we're getting fact checked as false because they're trying to keep the lid so tightly on a narrative that they don't want even to be discussed. Was there election fraud in this election? I'm not even talking about whether there was or there wasn't. They don't even want you discussing it. That's power. That's a lot of power. We don't have, you know, I only have limited time. Let me switch to um, some of the possible solutions, share some of my thoughts, um, and make um, one gigantic uh, suggested takeaway, if I may. I think at this point there's tremendous bipartisan support for the idea that something has to be done about big tech. I mean, the left hates big tech because they think they allow conservatives and Trump to get, you know, Trump to get elected. The left hates big tech for not censoring enough. We're concerned that big tech is censoring too much. Um, but the fight is on a, pr if there is bipartisan consensus that something must be done, it's very important because when the fight switches to what should be done about it, in the case of censorship, there are going to be major implications because the left wants to make the decision and Silicon Valley wants to make the decision on censorship. Some people in Washington want to make the decision on censorship. Conservatives want no one to make the decision on censorship. So that is going to be, you know, a real, a real, um, you know, battle. Um, in terms of um, uh, that point, we also got our hands exclusively on a Google internal document. It was called the Good Censor. It's like a 43-page. You can look all this up on Breitbart. It's on our site. Just don't try to find us through Google. Um, so um, this had a slide in the middle, and I remember so distinctly. Do you guys remember what teeter-totters are, you know, that in playgrounds that one kid's on one side, one kid's on the other side? So the teeter-totter on one side is free speech, and on the other side is civility. That's scary to me. Because the other side of the free speech coin is being looked at by Google as civility. Look, I'm in favor of civility. Civility is great, but that is not the other side of the free speech coin. Um, so the more you get a glimpse into their actual thinking, the more you start to understand. A lot of you have heard about uh, Section 230. I would imagine, is it Professor Haslett? Am I pronouncing that right? We didn't get to meet. Hazlett uh, probably talked about that. Let me speak about that for a moment. 230 resulted from concerns back in the early days of the internet about um, uh, allowing uh, internet companies and websites to have user content put on their sites but not necessarily be held liable for it. And what it really kind of said was, it, it, you can moderate some of that content and just because you moderate some of it, and not others, we're not gonna hold you responsible. Like they didn't wanna say, well you moderated this, but you didn't moderate that, so we're gonna sue you for that. And they realized it's gonna be messy and very hard for um, you know, all this stuff to be moderated, and I think it was you know, to a large degree an accommodation for that. 
but 230 also protects a lot of other things. Breitbart has over 5 million comments a month. 230 protects Breitbart from its commenters, from being, I say this, from being sued because of things that are posted in its comment section, just because we try to moderate our comment section. So if someone says to you, I'm in the opinion phase, guys. If someone says to you, the answer is to repeal 230, it's not that simple, and a simple repeal will cause a lot of harm. It's a more complicated question than simple repeal. Um, if you are a champion of free speech and a free press, I don't think a pure repeal of 230 makes a lot of sense. So here you have the situation, Dems think 230 doesn't or allows big tech not to moderate enough. Doesn't let them take off the hate speech, the stuff that makes them uncomfortable. Republicans think big tech is allowing them to moderate too much in the form of censorship. So you have this weird um, uh, synergy that's kind of circling around 230 in DC. One thing that has been suggested by a prominent Republican senator is that uh, internet companies should lose their 230 protection uh, unless they agree or are proven not to be censoring for political point of view. But they want that certification to come from the FTC. The FTC is the Federal Trade Commission. It's comprised of five people. They're all political appointees. Uh, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate. Uh, at any one time, only three can be, three is the most that can be from any one party. But the point here is, and I wouldn't be surprised if Professor Hazlitt made a point similar to this, do you really want those five people deciding who is and who isn't doing good, isn't censoring properly or who's, you know, exercising a, a proper drawing the lines on political uh, censorship in the right ways, uh, especially when one year uh, you might have three Republicans, another year you might have three Democrats. Um, I'm not optimistic that that's a solution. I think that um, a lot of state attorney generals have very strong consumer protection laws, and every time Big Tech goes up there and Sergey Pinkai, the CEO of Google, says, we don't interfere with search results, which is a provable lie. Breitbart did reporting. We got our hands on blacklists from inside Google. Exactly what they deny. At this point, we are past being able to prove that they're lying. Okay. Um, um, but I think because they're lying, there are some opportunities, and this gets a little in the weeds, through consumer protection statutes, some state attorney generals can ask, can subpoena big tech companies without going to litigation first. Because what we've seen is when people go to litigation, they're getting blown out of court. Google, Facebook, Twitter say we have a First Amendment right to do what we want or we have the protection of Section 230, there's a whole host of things. And what no one's been able to do through civil litigation is get discovery. Discovery is what happens after the lawsuit is filed and you get past the first stage and you get to ask questions and get documents from the other side. No one's been able to crack that code. So it's really hard to get the evidence of the wrongdoing when they are holding all the evidence of the wrongdoing and in many cases hiding it. So I will suggest this as well. Too many conservatives, many of whom are my friends, are for philosophical and business theory reasons um, against solutions requiring regulation, antitrust, legislation, government intervention. Okay? You know, to them I say, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can. Um, you can sit in ivory towers um, and you can discuss business theory and you can argue about how many angels fit on the head of a pin while you whistle past the graveyard. 
and free speech and the conservative movement is destroyed in this country by these companies. This is, this is a war. I've shared a little bit with you tonight. I've only got an hour. This is a fight for getting ideas out there. I happen to believe more ideas the better. I'm a conservative. I would never argue for censoring a lefty or a left-wing publication. But that's what they're arguing about right-wing now. So the other thing that makes it even more difficult, a lot of these same friends and institutions in DC who are saying, don't intervene, don't regulate, don't bring antitrust, don't do any intervention. I say this um, very, you know, this is not a happy thing to report. Um, a lot of them are getting money from big tech. And we reported on a lot of it. Um, and um, to push these ideas that a free market uh, is a solution, you know, to all of these, you know, problems. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of enabling of, I want to be careful. I think there's a lot of enabling of big tech um, on both sides. Um, but again, if you're going to argue that regulation is not the answer, I would submit to you the only way you're going to avoid that is to break these guys apart. So here's my broad takeaway. You've been very kind to listen to this guy talk for a while. Um, when discussing potential solutions, don't take anything off the table. The only chance, and I am not optimistic, I've been dealing with this for the better part of three years, the only chance of convincing big tech to govern themselves better or govern themselves at all is the fear that if they don't, it's going to be over for them. Or better yet, they're going to be broken up. This is a war, OK? If you're not already in this war, it's time to get in the fight. And this is a war with such existential consequences, every possible angle of attack should be explored. You know, we've talked, but you know, you've heard a little bit of solutions. Natural, even non-natural alliances need to be formed. I'm grateful that Hillsdale has invited me here to share some, you know, thinking on this uh, subject. Um, you know, for what it's worth, what I've learned about a lot of things is that, um, and big techs like this, it's like a Jenga game. And you never know what piece, what angle of attack, what lawsuit's going to break through and get discovery. It's going to pull the whole thing down. And very often, it's not the one we're looking at or considering right now. So let's keep pulling blocks because, as this thing said, and I hope you agree, I've made the case for this today. This is a time for action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Solov. We now have time for one or two questions. If you have a question, please make your way to a microphone on the aisle. I covered everything perfectly? Or is it late? <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned that the left dominates media and Hollywood, and I believe you mentioned one more thing. I care. Academics and now big tech, but yeah. Why is that, do you think? Do you think the right dropped the ball on that? It's a great question. There's a lot of answers to this. Um, I think that, um, yes, in part, the ball was dropped. But I think more there was a clear vision early in the, in the 1900s, maybe 1920s, uh, this idea of cultural Marxism and the long march through the institutions. Uh, a lot of um, uh, people at that time realized that this country did not have the appetite for uh, you know, Marxism through the front door of the political process. And what they started to realize was we're going to play the long game. 
and through uh, what's commonly referred to as cultural Marxism, we're going to, over time, shape, because by the way, and this, Andrew Breitbart said this, and this is 100% true, politics is downstream from culture. And if you can, and they realized if you can change the culture and start controlling the cultural institutions, you will control the political institutions. So I think, yeah, I don't like the finger pointing of the right, you know, dropping the ball. I'm sure there's a lot of that. Some of it is the left saw this clearly. And um, to the extent that you can discuss it, I'm, by the way, this is obviously a very broad brush answer, but uh, I think that there is a very deliberate, smart effort in that regard. And I think that what we're seeing now is that all the people who grew up uh, with uh, you know, critical thinking or theory and, and academia and the Hollywood and, and, and with a, a liberally biased news media are now the people who are in power in big tech and are now the people who are in power in corporations. And if I had more time to talk about a different subject, I'd talk about corporations because that's a, a whole other ball game that's worthy of discussion. Yeah, sure, thank you. We have time for one more question. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Sure, thank you for coming. We heard from Dr. Robert Epstein yesterday, and in the case of Google, um, he made the claim that because they buy so many small companies, it would be very difficult to use an antitrust lawsuit or to break them up effectively. What would be your response to that? My response would be several fold. Um, and Dr. Epstein's amazing. We work with him all the time. Um, we've worked with Dr. Epstein going back to a big uh, town hall we did together in New Orleans in 2018. Um, I think it's hard, again, it's hard to discuss these issues because there's so many, like, I think the DOJ antitrust action trying to break up Google on search and search advertising should be going on. I doubt he was referring to that because he was probably referring just to the censorship issue. I wasn't there, unfortunately, I don't know. Um, same thing with ad tech. I think you know breaking them up is a good idea. I think I disagree with Dr. Epstein. Um, I agree with some of what he's saying, uh, but I also disagree. Right now, the big barrier is nobody can come in. Think about this. I always have, I wanna say one more thing, and I know you're probably out of time, but I think this is a, a point that's, that, that I, I'd like to make, even if it's the last one you allow me to make. Um, I hear all the time, why don't we just create our own? Why don't conservatives just create their own? Okay. Um, Bing, if you're not familiar with it, was Microsoft. Microsoft is a good big company. And they decided to take on Google. And they did Bing, and they put it on every Microsoft product. And you guys might not remember, I don't even know what their ad budget was, but you know, I'm gonna make it up. It had to be 10 billion because for four months, all I saw was advertising, advertisements for Bing. And I think Microsoft, with all that money, all that understanding, all that ad budget, all that technology, managed to carve out a whopping 4% of the search market. So I think this idea, you know, why don't we just create our own is the reason they have to be broken up on search like this DOJ is to allow competition to come in and for new things to develop. A lot of people don't remember, Google really came to ascendancy because of the Microsoft antitrust action in the 90s. And if it weren't for that, Google would not have been put in the position to become you know, what Google became. The only other thing I'd say, I also hear a lot, why don't we create a conservative Twitter? a conservative Facebook, I would submit that is the worst thing we can do. We cannot cede the battlefield of ideas. We cannot leave it. What would they like better, I'm speaking about the left, than to put conservatives in a ghetto? To be in our own little Twitter, our own little universe, where we're just kind of off to the side. So I don't think that's a very promising solution. And, and you know, not to mention the fact that you know, most of my family and friends are liberal guys, and I'm on Facebook. Um, I don't post on Facebook, but you, know, you wanna see your family and friends uh, jokes and family and pictures from college. And 
that's not segregated by, you know, conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat. I don't think we want to be in a world where I've got a Facebook to interact with, you know, everyone and a Facebook just to interact on political ideas. And I think that's so unhealthy for our society that political ideas and political discussions should be ghettoized like that. So thanks for letting me add that to it. Please join me in thanking Mr. Solov.